Hello everyone, this is Dr. Eduardo Patrick Beltran. Um, I am an internist, also dermatologist, research scientist, vitamin D expert, and director of the St. Patrick Institute of Medical Sciences. Um, today's presentation is going to be about the epigenetic, epigenetic role of vitamin D and how we can use vitamin D as an epigenetic approach for, for being able to treat autoimmune diseases. So, uh, welcome and uh, we will be talking about many different things uh, starting off with uh, the definition of what dysbiosis is and how we classify dysbiosis in our body talking a little bit about leaky gut syndrome we're also going to be talking about the relationship between fiber mucin tight junctions and vitamin d3 we will be uh, talking about leaky brain syndrome also about the fetal susceptibility hypothesis how this also contributes to nutrigenomics, the importance of nutrigenomics and the relationship with single nucleotide polymorphisms. And then we will be digging in more to talk about the vitamin D gene polymorphisms and how it is important to be able to compensate these genes in order to get that epigenetic regulation that we're looking for. Um, finally, um, a new concept that I'm introducing and that we will be talking a little bit more in detail, known as the vitamin D receptor cleansing um, through diet modification concept. I think this is a very important concept that uh, perhaps some of you are not familiar with. And uh, after seeing all of this, we will be showing a clinical case of a patient who has psoriasis and how she was uh, treated with a protocol that I developed known as the leaky gut syndrome protocol, which basically um, treats the polymorphisms in regards to her vitamin D genes and other genes that are related with the methylation cycle. So once again, uh, thank you for uh, watching this presentation and I hope you enjoy it. So let's go ahead and begin. So let's go ahead and start by defining what dysbiosis is. Dysbiosis is the imbalance of a person's natural microflora or microbiome diversity population and especially that of the gut but it's not limited to, and it is influenced by the environmental factors such as the quality of the air, the water, the diet, the medications that that patient might be taking, and also the presence of single nucleotide polymorphisms and vitamin D and cofactor levels, which are very important which because, because these can contribute to a range of health conditions by sustained inflammation, which leads to autoimmunity and sometimes even cancer. So that's the uh, extra little thing I would like to add there that the presence of vitamin D and cofactor levels are very, very important because they do play a very important role in the regulation of our microbiome, okay? So as we can see, here we have the way how we uh, can classify dysbiosis. Things that can influence this dysbiosis, as we said a little bit earlier, air, water, food, you know, these can be examples such as, you know, air pollution, lack of, uh, you know, adequate drinking water, fluoride that might be in our water, pesticides, insecticides in our crops, genetic modified organisms, preservatives found in our foods. Also, patients that have bad food choices, you know, that consume a lot of foods that are rich in lectins, gluten, dairy, sugars and fructose and processed foods. Let us not forget that gluten is a lectin. Okay, and that we also have lectins in dairy, such as casein. And obviously, you know, a lot of patients take medications. And some, some of the things that can actually alter our, our microbiome are excessive use or indiscriminate use of antibiotics, proton pump inhibitors, hormones, diabetic medications, corticosteroids can alter our microbiome and lead us to dysbiosis. Also, Vitamin D levels are very important. The lack of adequate sunlight exposure, you know, obesity, medications, SNPs, and mutations of specific genes that are responsible for the metabolism of vitamin D levels in our body, diet that is poor in vitamin D, and also include, you know, diseases that can affect liver and kidneys because as we know liver metabolism is very important for vitamin d conversion as the same thing for kidney conversion okay so when we classify dysbiosis by systems this can be found at the oral dental um, site it could also be sinorespiratory gastrointestinal 
or and hepatobiliary, which is the main one that we're going to be talking today about. It can also be dysbiosis of the skin, of the eyes, lymphatic and blood. But <clears throat> here's something that I would like to go ahead and mention about the gastrointestinal tract. 80% of our immune system is found in the GI tract, right? So having dysbiosis of the GI tract is a major contributor for inflammation, which eventually will cause an autoimmune disease. And sometimes even if that inflammation persists long enough, can actually become cancer, okay? So let's go ahead and start talking a little bit about leaky gut syndrome, okay? There are two articles. If you'd like to go ahead and read those, I, I got this information from these articles over there. There are plenty of articles out there talking about leaky gut syndrome, but I've tried to make this as easy as possible so we could all have the big picture of what's actually going on, okay? So here in this first diagram, as you can see right over here, we have our enterocytes with the villi, and here we have uh, an individual that's getting exposed. It could be gluten, to lectin, to a toxin, to a specific bacteria. Let's imagine that this is gluten, and these little red rods are our microbiome, our bacteria, right? So whenever we consume gluten, we know that gluten is made up of prolamins, and one of those prolamins is gliadin and glutenin. Now, gliadin, once it gets absorbed by the enterocyte, it upregulates another protein known as zonulin. And this is going to act upon the tight junctions that are right over here, as I'm showing you, okay, which are represented by the occludins. And zonulin, when it gets upregulated, it breaks this bond. So it ends up breaking this occludin bond and increases the permeability for this uh, prolamin known as gliadin which is by the way a lectin and now makes its way through um, the gastrointestinal barrier by increasing the permeability causing what we know as leaky gut syndrome and this protein or this molecule or gliadin or lectin whatever you would like to go ahead and call it you know is not going to just go in but it's also going to open up the door for other things to be able to filter in such as bacteria lipopolysaccharides endotoxins i mean you name it okay so now all of these molecules or proteins and bacteria and toxins and lipopolysaccharides are going to start um, interacting with our immune system and obviously, the first line of defense, as we know, is our innate immune system. Here we have our microphage is going to try to um, get rid of these uh, proteins or form proteins or toxins by phagocytosis. And it's going to digest this. And it's obviously going to present this antigen to a T lymphocyte. And this T lymphocyte is going to present this to our B cell. As we know, B cells eventually become plasmatic cells that make antibodies. And these antibodies are going to end up making what we call immune complex formations, a way of being able to neutralize the foreign body that came in. Now, our body is doing this on a continuous basis. And we have what we call our immunologic tolerance. Now, when, let's say, that individual is consuming wheat on a regular basis and has a lot of inflammation going on, we can have increased permeability, and there will be a reaching point, a breaking point, let us go ahead and say it that way, a breaking point where this immunologic tolerance gets overwhelmed and now cannot deal with this excess amount of um, lectins and toxins and lipopolysaccharides that are getting getting through and then unfortunately something happens is known as what we know as molecular mimicry many times these foreign proteins or LPSs you know or toxins might uh, have a specific um, amino acid sequence that might look like endogenous proteins that you might have in your own body or in specific tissues, such as, let's say, our skin. And that can cause conditions such as psoriasis, vitiligo, uh, eczema, atopic dermatitis, and you name it. It also can affect our thyroid. Here we can have hypothyroidism, such as Hashimoto's disease, or Graves' disease, and hyperthyroidism, 
or it can affect the motor neuron. These antibodies start attacking, you know, proteins that uh, are found in, in the brain or in the nerves and cause multiple sclerosis, Parkinson, ALS, Alzheimer's, myasthenia gravis, or it could act upon the own, uh, upon the enterocyte itself, causing celiac disease, gluten sensitivity, IBS, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and so forth all through a mechanism known as molecular mimicry. So this is the concept of as what we know as leaky gut syndrome, okay? So here we have another concept which is very important. It's also known as the fiber mucetide junction and vitamin D relationship. And here in this image, as you can see, um, here we have are enterocytes that are bound together by their tight junctions. These are the tight junctions. And as you can see, we have this green layer, which is mucin, that mucus layer that helps separate the um, immune system from interacting with the uh, microbiome. Okay, so this mucin layer plays a key role in isolating and separating any form of interaction between our innate immune system with interaction with our microbiome okay so vitamin d plays a very important role here and i'll talk to you guys about it in just a second but first i would like to mention something that's very important on what these goblet cells do these goblet cells are responsible for producing mucin but they rely heavily on the production of fatty acids that come from our microbiome, especially from the bifidin bacteria. But this bifidin bacteria re requires uh, pr the presence of fiber in order for them to be able to digest, right, um, that fiber and produce those fatty acids, okay? So the small fatty acid chains are going to be the source of food for these goblet cells in conjunction also with zinc. Zinc is very important because their studies have shown that when we have low levels of zinc, we have less goblet cells that will be producing mucin. And also uh, zinc is very important for the, the, the differentiation of the enterocytes. So whenever we have adequate amounts of fiber, this fiber will feed our bifidin bacterium, our bifidin bacterium will make that small chain fatty acids, which will feed our goblet cells and our goblet cells in conjunction with the zinc will make that mucus layer known as mucin, that glycocalyx that we find and separates our microbiome from interacting with our immune system. And by the way, as I said, 80% of our immune system is found where? in the gut okay so having this said we know that whenever we have good levels of vitamin d vitamin d inhibits the production of zonulin remember i said zonulin gets upregulated whenever we get in contact with gliadin and gliadin once it upregulates zonulin zonulin is going to break that bond that we have right over here with these tight junctions so whenever we are having patients take vitamin d as a supplement they're going to be making down the road a hormone known as calcitrol which is the active uh, metabolite of vitamin d that inhibits the production of zonulin and hence preserves the integrity of these tight junctions okay so vitamin d plays a very important role in maintaining the integrity of the tight junctions and also has a direct role in maintaining a healthy microbiome diversity population, okay? And let us not forget that zinc is an important cofactor for adequate levels or adequate numbers of goblet cells and aids in the differentiation of these enterocytes, okay? So let's keep on going. Now let's talk about the fiber that we have in our diet. Now, I did mention that the fiber that we consume feeds the bifidin bacterium, correct? But we must remember that not all fibers are the same. For instance, 
we know that wheat is a source that is rich in gluten and gluten is made up of two forms of prolamins which are lectins one of them we already mentioned is called gliadin and the other one is glutenin right gliadin we know that acts upon those tight junctions and it breaks those tight junctions by upregulating zonulin correct but let us not forget that 90 percent of the wheat that we consume here in the united states and also in brazil is, well that's where i work as a physician by the way okay is covered by insecticides and herbicides and one of them that we consume a lot is roundup known as glyphosate now glyphosate back in the 1990s if i'm not mistaken 1996 or 98 i'm not too sure but has a patent as an antibiotic so as we know not only does wheat have gluten and gluten has gliadin and gliadin breaks down those tight junctions but we also are consuming wheat that is covered with roundup and, or known as glyphosate and glyphosate is an antibiotic that also can kill your microbiome diversity so now if we compare this image with this image here we're going to be having increased permeability because of the presence of gliadin correct and also since we know glyphosate is an antibiotic besides being a herbicide right it also will kill the microbiome that we have in our intestine and reducing the number of, of bacteria that are responsible for producing that fatty acid small chain fatty acid which feeds the goblet cells so this ends up making a mucin that is very thin fine and hence ends up causing more interaction between our immune system with our microbiome and when that interaction takes place this starts causing an overreactivity our immunologic tolerance now starts getting activated and perhaps if this uh, diet of this patient persists will increase that leaky gut syndrome and also promote more inflammation so having all this uh, fiber um, that is not healthy is not good for us covered with her you know um, glyphosate is just making things worse and obviously if you even have low zinc levels well we're not going to be having a lot of goblet cells that are going to be producing mucin at the end right so this is just one of those things that are very important that we must take into consideration whenever we are feeding ourselves with the source of fiber that comes from wheat rye um, um, oats as well because oats can also have cross-contamination and they also have a form of a prolamin known as avenin which is also inflammatory right and also um, barley because barley is a form of has gluten right so here in the presence also of low levels of vitamin d we are just going to have loose tight junctions increased permeability and once once these lipopolysaccharides toxins gliadin reach into our bloodstream they're going to reach our blood brain barrier and guess what they cause they end up, end up causing excuse me end up causing leaky brain syndrome and i'll talk about, i'll talk a little bit about that in just a second okay now here's a real interesting image i would like to go ahead and show you guys there's a uh, this is, i took this out from an article i'll give you the uh the article link so you can guys check it out here we have a quantitative image of the gut microbiota and spatial organization in mice okay so this region over here is our mucin layer as you can see right over here so in this case we have mice that were fed with a rich um, fiber diet versus mice that were fed with a very poor uh, fiber diet and as you can see this these mice had an adequate you know layer of mucin that helped separate the microbiome from interacting with who the immune system and over here obviously we can see a thinning of that barrier and obviously this will increase the interaction between our immune system 
with the microbiome. Okay, so here we have our goblet cells. It's just a, an image just to be able to relate a little bit more to it. So here's the beauty of this uh, study. As you can see, right over here at the base of these, at the crypts, as we, these are what we call the crypts, right, of Libercum. Here we can see that there is everything that's in the color in the red in the color of red means that there's interaction with immune cells okay so the lamina propria is this is the region that's most closest to the lamina propria and this is the villi that we see in our gastrointestinal tract so everything that is green basically means no interaction and everything that is red means interaction with our immune cells okay now, this was the kind of image that we would be seeing when the patient has a rich diet in fiber and, and good quality fiber, which allows to have a good layer of mucin. Now, look what happens when we have a diet that's poor in fiber. So here we go. It basically lights up, as you can see, you see. So now, whenever you see this, this means that you have a whole bunch of immune cells interacting directly with the microbiome. This shows you the importance of having a good mucin layer that separates the microbiome from interacting with the lamina propria. And let us not forget, 80% of our immune system is found where? In our gut. Okay? That's the link of the article, by the way. Okay, so here we have the intestinal villi, normal fiber diet. Immune cells are found not only at the base of the villi of the crypts, the brick and crypt, that's why we have color red. And over here, the intestinal villi, which is low in fiber diet, immune cells are activated and are found the whole extent of the villi, which means more immune interaction with the microbiome, right? what I just said. So let's start talking a little bit about and debunking bad signs, okay? Now remember there was, a, there once came out an article that was actually published by Harvard. It said gluten-free diet may cause and affect cardiovascular risk. And this is what it says. Going gluten-free, there may be a downside to skipping heart-healthy grains. And uh, this is even put out in the Celiac Disease Foundation website. Study finds gluten-free diet in adults without celiac disease may increase the risk for cardiovascular disease. So now here we have, you know, these uh, this study and this organization, this foundation, stating, hey, if you go gluten-free, guess what happens? You're going to be more prone to getting cardiovascular disease. Now, let me go ahead and debunk this bad science because I'll tell you why this is happening, okay? So, this was a research study that was published in the British Medical Journal, which concluded that long-term gluten consumption is not associated with the risk of coronary heart disease, but rather the lack of gluten in the diet may affect cardiovascular risk. So what was happening? The reason why this happened is because patients, when they were going gluten-free, they were they ended up reducing their fiber kind in the first place. So, and as we know, if we have a diet that's, you know, uh, fiber, I mean, poor in fiber content, we're going to be increasing our leaky gut syndrome which increases inflammation and this is why it is explaining that there's an increase in acute coronary syndrome this is exactly what i just explained before so going gluten free means that you're not supposed to only just take out you know gluten but you're supposed to substitute it with another source of fiber so fiber is something very important that needs to go in our diet this is the reason why these patients who went gluten-free ended up having more inflammation, more leaky gut, and that increased, obviously, the susceptibility in getting an acute coronary syndrome. All right? So here we go once again. All right? Here's a diet rich in fiber and diet poor in fiber. So that's going to increase inflammation. All right. So now let's go ahead and talk a little bit about leaky gut syndrome. All right? As we know, leaky gut syndrome, once this sets place, it's going to allow the presence of toxins, lectins, and lipopolysaccharides, and sometimes some bacteria to get through. And this eventually is going to end up causing what we know as leaky brain syndrome. Okay? Now, 
let us not remember, let us not, uh, let us recall that the brain doesn't have the same histologic um, disposition, right, as the gut. But we do have something in, in common. We have tight junctions that are found between endothelial cells. So these are the, this is a blood vessel right over here. That's a red blood cell. And this is an endothelial cell. And these endothelial cells are bound together by the presence of tight junctions. Okay? And interestingly, interestingly whenever there is leaky gut syndrome, these lipopolysaccharides and also some lectins, such as gluten, you know, they end up making it all the way to the brain. And as we know, lipopolysaccharides, they act upon this pathway known as the roa rock nf kappa b pathway which plays a important uh, important pathogenesis in promoting leaky brain syndrome and we'll talk about that in just a second so here it says lipopolysaccharides you know lps's directly or indirectly injures brain microvascular endothelial cells and damages the intercellular tight junction that gives rise to an altered blood-brain barrier permeability so here we have the tight junctions okay these are the occludens and the claudins right so when we have a lipopolysaccharide it's going to act upon the roa rock um, nf kappa b pathway it's going to cause contraction of these occludens or these tight junctions and when this contracts it's going to cause a folding or a bending of that bond between these two endothelial cells. And that bending causes the formation of a pore, which increases the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. And guess what? Vitamin D inhibits the Roa rock NF-kappa-B pathway. So it's really important to have adequate levels of vitamin D in order to make this always be, you know, in a... Um, impermeable state now here's an article that shows that vitamin d attenuates myocardial ischemia reperfusion injury by inhibiting the inflammation by suppressing this pathway that we just mentioned which is the roa rock nf kappa b pathway that's the link to the article you can go ahead and check it out all right so vitamin d people once again there we go now leaky gut must take place first in order to have leaky brain to manifest later down the road. Patients with celiac disease or gluten sensitivity, celiac, have higher chances of getting leaky brain syndrome. Their genetic predisposition makes them more prone in getting early neurodegenerative conditions. And look at here, look at this. So he, this is, let's say this is our endothelium right here, okay? And if we look at the diameter of the tight junction, it's of approximately 10 nanometers. Now, gliadin itself, the molecule, has a size that may be from 3.4 to 9.2 nanometers. So it can easily, you know, make its way through these tight junctions. And not only just that, but they can also promote inflammation, as we already have seen before, right? And now, let's go ahead and talk about the genesis of genetic polymorphisms. Here we're going to be talking about single nucleotide polymorphisms, also known as SNPs. So when we talk about these uh, genetic polymorphisms or SNPs, we must know that polymorphisms arise through mutations. And the mutation may be due to the change from one type of nucleotide to another, an insertion or a deletion or a rearrangement of nucleotides. But once they're formed, a polymorphism can be inherited like any other DNA sequence, allowing its inheritance to be tracked from parent to child. Okay? Now we're going to talk about something really, really interesting. And this is about the fetal susceptibility hypothesis. Okay? So, during World War II, in the winter of 1944, the German Nazi blockade 
cut off the supply of foods to the western provinces of the Netherlands. All right. And this caused a famine that affected 4 million people and killed approximately 20,000 people. And this had very, had very severe outcomes that, that stretched out for many generations later. All right. The Dutch winter famine extended itself over five generations, even after the war had ended. Now, a longitudinal study that was carried out by this guy over here, Dr. Professor David Barker, five decades later observed that the sums of people born to moms or mothers who experienced such conditions in their very first three months of pregnancy in the first trimester during the famine had significantly higher incidence of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and even cancer in their adult life. Now, this is what he called the fetal susceptibility hypothesis. Okay. Now, later on in the year of 2003 at the Duke University Medical Center, we had a study that was um, published by... Uh, Dr. Rob Waterland and Dr. Randy uh, Jertle, which was a, a groundbreaking discovery that was done in agouti mice. So here you can see, that's the article right there. There's the link. You can go ahead and check it out. And the reason why this was a brown, groundbreaking discovery is because what they did was basically have two genetically identical sisters receive a diet which one of them was rich in methyl groups and the other one was just normal, you know, mouse chow, I guess you could call it that. And interestingly, the mother that, um, the, the mouse that received the normal mouse chow became obese and even changed in color from being brown to yellow, as you can see in this image right over here. This is actually a picture that's actually seen in uh, the article itself. So... And this is what they were able to find, okay? So a female yellow mouse a, has an agouti gene it's, that is unmethylated and active, okay? Whenever they fed this mother mouse a diet that was supplemented uh, during pregnancy with methyl groups, and here we have methylcobalamin, methylfolate, choline, betaine, et cetera, et cetera, all methyl groups, they noticed that the majority of the offspring were mostly brown and healthy, and the agouti gene was methylated, was methylated and silenced, right? Now, if this mother received a non-dietary supplementation, which means a normal mouse child with no methyl groups added, the majority of that offspring was mainly yellow, unhealthy, prone to obesity, and the agouti gene was unmethylated and was active. And this is why there was expression of the same phenotype, as you can see right over here. So this was groundbreaking uh, uh, science that was being made, which demonstrated that, you know, in the early fetal development phase where the mother, if she is exposed to a diet that is rich in methyl groups, has a huge impact in how the health of that baby will be down the road once it becomes an adult, okay? Because our epigenome is regulated by methyl groups. And let me go ahead and explain this better, okay? So as we know, our human genome is made up of approximately from 20,000 to 25,000 genes, okay? Now, that DNA is let's just go ahead and call it it's composed of a hardware and this hardware is responsible for giving that uh, uh, instruction of how that cell's structure is going to be and this is what represents our genome okay but also our dna has a software as well which is responsible for executing different functions all right or different programs okay and this is what we know as our epigenome, okay? So when we talk about the methylation cycle, the methylation cycle, when it comes to the folate 
um, synthesis, right? We know that that helps in the upregulation and the production of DNA, right? And also the methionine cycle helps in the production of methyl groups. So that's going to help promote uh, the epigenome, the expression or downregulation or upregulation of certain genes by the presence of methyl groups. So whenever our diet is rich in methyl groups, there's going to be more methylation. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about the vitamin D physiology and eventually talk about polymorphisms regarding the vitamin D genes. As we know, um, the sun is responsible for producing a form of ultraviolet rays known as UVB, which acts upon our skin, forming what we know acts upon our a form of cholesterol known as 70 hydrocholesterol, which transforms this into cholecalciferol. Okay, now this 70 hydrocholesterol, 65% is found in the epidermis and 35% is found in the dermis. All right. Um, the 70 hydrocholesterol, once it gets in contact with this UVB rays, it transforms it into cholecalciferol, and this eventually is going to be transported all the way to the liver. Now, cholecalciferol has a half-life of only 24 hours, okay? And once it reaches the uh, liver, there is a gene by the name of CYP2R1, which upregulates a converting enzyme known as 25-hydroxylase, which will convert cholecalciferol into a pro-hormone uh, or pre-hormone, if you'd like to go ahead and call it like that, known as calcifidyl, or also known as 25-hydroxyvitamin D. Now, calcifidyl has a half-life of three weeks, okay? And uh, this is the most abundant form or the most abundant metabolite because it's tightly bound to the vitamin D binding protein, which is also upregulated by the gene known as vitamin D binding protein gene. Okay, this is a protein that binds to calcifidyl and transports it to different parts of the body and especially to the kidneys. Okay, this is what I know, uh, this is what I refer to as our vitamin D um, reservoir. Okay, so whenever our body requires more vitamin D, it's going to utilize calcifidyl and burn it to be able to transform it into calcitrol, which is the actual hormone of vitamin D, okay? And interestingly, calcifidyl has a half-life of three weeks. Now, once calcifidyl is transported to the kidneys, thanks to the vitamin D binding protein, there's another uh, enzyme that's upregulated by a gene known as CYP27B1 at the level of the proximal um, convoluted tubule, upregulates an enzyme known as 125-alpha- hydroxylase and this transforms calcifidyl into calcitriol which is the actual active metabolite or hormone of vitamin d calcitriol has only a half-life of only two hours maybe perhaps even a little bit more like two to three or perhaps max four hours but this explains the importance why Vitamin D must be supplemented on a daily basis. If we do not supplement on a daily basis, you will not be making calcitriol on a daily basis, okay? And as we said, it is calcitriol that acts upon those tight junctions at the level of the gut in order to preserve that integrity, all right? Avoiding that leaky gut syndrome that we just mentioned a little bit earlier before, right? So... And let us not forget as well that our immune system is also equipped with that enzyme, that converting enzyme known as 125-alpha hydroxylase. So it does not necessarily need calcitriol. It can actually transform calcifidyl into calcitriol intracellularly, okay? But all the other cells in our body also have that same capability, okay? So it's really important to understand that the active metabolite that we have is known as calcitriol, and it only has a half-life of only two hours, okay? Cholecalciferol has a half-life of 24 hours. 
calcifidal has a half-life of three weeks, and calcitrol has a half-life of two hours, okay? Now, it's important to understand that whenever we have a genetic polymorphism that affects any one of these genes that are responsible in the production of uh, calcifidal, calcitrol, in the transport of calcifidal, or even in the degradation of calcitrol, we're going to be having problems with vitamin D sufficiency or deficiency, okay? Now, every single cell in our body, every single organ, every single tissue has vitamin D receptors, all right? And these vitamin D receptors are upregulated by a gene known as VDR gene, okay? And we can also have polymorphisms of these vitamin D receptors where there is a lack of affinity between calcitriol with that vitamin D receptor, okay? So that's something also that we have to keep in mind. Let us not forget that 80% of our immune system is found in the gastrointestinal tract, and this is why it's very important to treat the gastrointestinal tract and microbiome when we are treating autoimmune diseases. Now, vitamin D encodes approximately 10% of the entire human genome. That's a lot, okay? Vitamin D regulates approximately 2,000 genes in adults and 3,000 genes during fetal development. Hence, the importance of vitamin D supplementation during pregnancy, okay? Now, here's something really interesting about pregnancy, okay? One of the things that we have noticed in the medical literature in the last 10 to 15, 20 years is that when women are pregnant, the metabolism of vitamin D is very much accelerated. And we see that there is a 35% increase in the production or the expression of a gene known as CYP27B1, which upregulates 125 alpha hydroxylase which converts calcifidal into calcitriol. And this is why we see that during pregnancy, there are elevated levels sometimes of calcitriol uh, circulating in the body that are much, much more higher than what we would consider normal, according to laboratory reference. But this is physiologic. This is a physiologic change, okay? I just wanted to run by and give you guys that, okay? Now, here we have, once again, our pathway. So UVB acts upon our skin, acts upon 7-D hydrocholesterol. This is transformed into cholecalciferol. Cholecalciferol is going to be bound to a vitamin D binding protein. It's going to go to the liver. Here we're going to have an a enzyme known as 25-hydroxylase, which is going to transform cholecalciferol into calcifidyl. Cal cal calcifidyl is going to be bound to vitamin D binding protein and this is going to go all the way to the kidneys and our kidneys are going to have an enzyme known as 125 hydroxylase which are going to transform calcifidyl into calcitriol okay also known as 125 dehydroxyvitamin D now this is going to go to every single uh, tissue in our body every single cell in our body because all our cells have vitamin D receptors for calcitriol and also for cholecalciferol and also for calcifidyl, okay? Now, the genes that are responsible for making CYP, uh, 25 hydroxylase is CYP2R1, and the gene responsible for making the enzyme 125 hydroxylase is CYP27B1, all right? So whenever we have polymorphisms here, we're going to be having deficiencies or insufficiencies in vitamin D. And let me show you how. So this is a normal patient. Let's say this patient takes 10,000 international units of vitamin D a day. If this system, if all this system is intact, these 10,000 international units of cholecalciferol should be equivalent also 10,000 to calcifidyl and 10,000 for calcitriol. That is if the whole system is intact. All right. But what we find in patients who have um, polymorphisms is that they might be taking 10,000 international units of vitamin D of cholecalciferol here. 
they will convert that into 10,000 calcifidyl. But if we look how much is made from calcitriol, it's only made 1,000. So there has been a loss of 9,000 international units, which means that we have a polymorphism of the gene CYP27B1, which is probably not making enough amounts of 125-hydroxylase, or we are making a defective enzyme that converts calcifidyl into calcitriol in adequate amounts. So now let's talk about this concept, which I think is very important. It's known as the vitamin D uh, receptor cleansing um, concept, or also known as the VDR cleansing through diet modification concept, which basically consists in the following. When leaky gut syndrome is present, many bacterial toxins, lipopolysaccharides, or also known as LPSs, and mycotoxins have high affinity for vitamin D receptors. This is a mechanism of evolution on behalf of these microorganisms, which inhibit adequate immune response. When these receptors are blocked, they inhibit calcitriol or they inhibit calcifidyl or cholecalciferol from binding to that receptor. And when vitamin D3 is given to these patients, they begin making more calcitriol, which further acts upon the enterocytes and allows for the tight junctions to close up better. And vitamin D also has a direct impact on regulating our microbiome as we mentioned prior. But also the gastrointestinal lining, which is made up by the enterocyte, changes approximately every 90 to 100 days. So it takes a while. Fortifying these tight junctions and improving the gut health through an anti-inflammatory diet, and that means eliminating gluten, dairy, lectins and sugars induces significant changes in our microbiome and increases the production of mucin reducing toxin lps permeability and while this is taking place in the gut the vitamin d receptors that were initially blocked eventually phase out from existence and are replaced with new ones these new existing vitamin d receptors are now ready to work with circulating vitamin D metabolites. And this is the concept that I call vitamin D receptor cleansing through diet modification. Okay? So as you can see right over here, here we have a patient who has dysbiosis. He might have severe small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or small intestinal fungal overgrowth, which causes leaky gut syndrome. And that was caused initially because the patient had a diet which was, was rich in gluten, dairy, lectin, sugars. This caused a uh, rupture of the tight junctions, increased the permeability. As you can see here, we have all these uh, bacterias and lipopolysaccharides and toxins and mycotoxins breaking through, interacting with our immune system or at the level of our lamina propria, overwhelming our immunologic tolerance. And once these lipopolysaccharides, bacterial toxins or mycotoxins make it through, like we said, they have an affinity of binding with vitamin D receptors. And when they bind, they can block these receptors and they don't allow vitamin D to act upon each of one of these vitamin D receptors in order to, in order to uh, cause or promote adequate normal cell function so now if we in this case as you can see both of these two receptors have been blocked by some form of lipopolysaccharide or toxin which causes complete vdr inhibition or you could have a partial vitamin d receptor inhibition as you can see okay now if we modify that diet right eliminating gluten dairy and lectins and sugars we reestablish those tight junctions, right? We increase those vitamin D levels in the blood. We, we introduce a healthy for a source of fiber that's not rich in gluten. We increase zinc in our diet, okay? And other cofactors that are impo important. I'll increase the production of mucin, right? Or that mucus layer that separates the microbiome from interacting with the enterocytes, right? and the lamina propria, 
what happens is that eventually this is going to reduce the presence of LPSs, the presence of toxins. And by compensating liver metabolism, kidney metabolism with high dose vitamin D therapy associated with other cofactors, which are very important, okay? And when these genes are all compensated by giving high vitamin D therapy, and we give cofactors that are very important for liver metabolism. One of those cofactors or supplements that I use is, for instance, is, you know, a diet that is rich in sulforaphanes, which can be found in broccolis and cauliflower and many other uh, f foods or vegetables that are rich in sulforaphanes and which enhance phase one and phase two metabolism. Some supplements that we can use here, for instance, is glutathione. We can also use alpha lipoic acid, all the um, liposoluble uh, vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, right, K2. These all enhance liver metabolism. And if you compensate those genes that are responsible for the methylation cycle, you will be enhancing liver metabolism and adequate kidney metabolism of vitamin D, okay? Hence, once this is all closed and these tight junctions are now uh, preserved and the integrity is now preserved, what is going to happen? Those new vitamin D receptors are going to be upregulated. So now these are going to be nice and ready to go to be able to act and respond to calcitrol by bounding to them, okay? And restoring vitamin D receptor function and cell function, all right? And let's not forget, every single cell in our body has vitamin D receptors, okay? Here's an important thing I always like to re re uh, re in reinstate is that 80% of our immune system is found in our gut, okay? Vitamin D has a huge influence on our immune system, has a huge influence on regulating these tight junctions, has a huge influence in regulating the microbiome, and interestingly, 90% of our serotonin is made in our gut and 10% is made in our brain. So vitamin D is a cofactor for the production of serotonin, by the way. As a matter of fact, vitamin D is essential for the production of dopamine, is a, a essential for the production of serotonin and melatonin because melatonin is derived from serotonin, all right? So that's a very important factor, okay? So here's our clinical case. Here we have a, one, a patient who is uh, 57 years old. She has a history of psoriasis that was not uh, treated adequately. She had already had tried steroids, methotrexate, um, she tried uh, some special diet modification, had no luck. She had been living with her psoriasis for many years. The, when she first consulted with me was in the, in the month of March of 2019. As you can see, she had many different plaques and lesions that were located underneath her breasts and her thighs, underneath her armpits, and also in her back, you know, and also affecting her scalp, as you can see here. And the patient began the treatment in the, in the month of June of 2019. So after five months, she was put on a diet, uh, a anti-inflammatory diet known as part of the, my protocol known as the leaky gut syndrome protocol, which is a diet which is, ex, is restrictive from gluten, lectins, dairy, sugars, okay? And she took a series of many other supplements associated with a high dose of vitamin D, uh, uh, D3 a day, which is 100,000 international units a day. And after five months, we can start now seeing changes taking place where these plaques and red, red the, the lesions that were found on her skin start now to disappear, disappear, right? As you can start seeing right here, okay? And then that was in the month of November 2019, and she kept on taking 100,000 international units a day of vitamin D3. And this is now in December 12, 2021. And she entered remission, okay? So that's one of my cases I wanted to share with you guys. 
Uh, there you can see her 25 hydroxy vitamin D was 142. Her calcitrol was um, 49. Her ionic calcium was 5.3. Calcium was 10.1. So there was no toxicity at all. And PTH was about 44.9. So we even could even increase the, the dosage. So there was no clinical signs of toxicity, no hypercalcemia evident on her labs. Taking 100,000 international units of vitamin D3, with the anti-inflammatory diet brought this patient back to remission as you guys can see there okay all right well i hope you guys enjoyed this presentation and see you next time